Welcome back to Carving the Stone Podcast, where our positive news articles come to life. I'm your host, Naisha Stone, and I'm also the founder of Carving the Stone. Um, as you can hear from the tagline, we cover positive news. Instead of saying how we cover positive news, I wanted to talk a little bit about our marketing department. Um, so a big part of us is offering marketing and, you know, a lot of people talk about the different things, but specifically we offer public relations. So if you need press releases or if you need a media liaison, the person that sets up the interviews, do all the coordination, um, we offer that. We also offer consulting. So sometimes you don't even know what you may need. So we can be, uh, we provide that helping hand uh, when it comes to interacting, whether it's with the media or your your target audience. So a big part of us is making sure you know that it's not all about coverage, but it's also about sales and specifically connecting with your audience. A lot of people try to pay for marketing and try to get that those ad placements and that coverage, but it's all about connecting with your audience. And so we bring the authenticity and that cultureness. Um, to marketing. So if you ever need us, hire Carbon Stone. You can reach us at reach us at dot com or at Carbon Stone and all social medias, including YouTube. Subscribe to us. We're trying to reach a thousand subscribers. So now I'm done with our little marketing session. <laughs> Let's bring on our next guest. Um, really interested to talk about Microsoft. Um, I pay a yearly subscription subscription to them, so I'm really excited to talk about the organization and just who they have who what they have on their team. So we have nice. How you say it? I'm sorry. I'm gonna let you say your name because I don't want to mess it up, and I, I'm gonna be. I'm gonna feel really bad. <laughs> Nisaini Rexash. Nisaini Rexash. There we go. I just had to say. I just, I was just telling her. Sometimes I say a name too much because I'm. I get so mad when people say my name wrong, and then I say it too many times, and then I say it wrong, and then here I am butchering someone's name. So I did not want to do that. So. Hey, <laughs> how you doing today, though? I'm doing terrific. How are you? I'm doing well. Um, I appreciate you for making time. Um, I know I reached out to you a few months ago and just you're busy. I'm busy. So um, and you were even busy today. So I appreciate you for uh, rescheduling and making time. So I really want to just dive into the conversation, specifically starting with Microsoft. So she is the community engagement manager at Microsoft, um, and she specifically works with um, the investments and when it comes to investing into the community. Um, so how did you get into this role um, and kind of why did you take it on? Yes, great question and one that I'm asked all the time. I you know, I know. <laughs> so interesting nonlinear path. I had absolutely no idea that I would end up in this role. These particular roles, if you think about being the funder and or grant maker for a large tech company, that really was not on my radar. I was a career changer when I decided to do Teach for America. And that really sort of rerouted where my career then followed. I stayed in the classroom beyond the two-year commitment to be in Teach for America and then matriculated from classroom teacher to working school-based administrative roles and then working for Chicago Public Schools at their network level, where I then worked across my 30 schools with the administrators on change management, strategy, and data analysis type of work. And once I formally left education after 11 years, I went over to nonprofit and I was a director of programming for a nonprofit organization, IC Stars, that runs a 16 week intensive internship for non traditional and untapped talent to get into tech. And while I was there, I had a board member who works at Microsoft and has been there now for 23 years. Mm. And through our relationship building and sort of seeing my skills and competence, was like, hey, I think. You can do a lot of what you're doing on a larger scale and through getting connected to other folks within Microsoft very shortly after that, I was then hired for this role, but it really came down to my network and people who were mentoring. Yeah, Nisa Amy, it's, it's, it's crazy because like you're, you're in Chicago, I'm in Milwaukee. So like a lot of the organizations you're, I've either interviewed or know of, but they all revolve around community and just, you know, playing that role. So I love what you do. Um, was it hard for you to switch from like, so Teach From America now to Microsoft? Those are like kind of two different like 
entities. So was that a hard switch for you? Or like, how did you prepare yourself for that? Or like, like what's the differences you would say? Yeah, so prior to doing Teach for America, I had already worked in sort of that private corporate sector, but then I was far removed for about between 11 and 12 years. I will say that role that I had at the district at Chicago Public Schools, like where I worked at the network level and had the 30 schools and the administrators, that role really set me up very well for what I'm doing now because there's a lot of stakeholder management. I manage a lot of different relationships, especially when you think about the role of a funder and a grant maker, those relationships to be able to articulate impact and how is the funding then scaling the mission or output, that role really helped me or set me up for success rather for the role that I now have. I don't think people talk about enough. Okay, so like, building a so we talk about building relationships right but no one talks about like how long it can honestly take to build a relationship to the point where you're actually getting funding so can you talk about you being on the we're giving out the funding side can you talk about like the beginning process of like for me for example like I can meet with a client a big client and they may need marketing so we have the first step is just them reaching out or me reaching out then the next step is us setting up the meeting. Then the third step is us just introducing stuff in the fourth, fifth. And then finally, maybe the seventh, eighth step is us finally signing the contract to the point where then we're actually getting paid. So can you walk about, like, can you talk about one of the, like, a long process? Because I don't think people ever talk about, like, okay, yeah, building relationships. But how do you, how does one, like, me keep those relationships going? And what can I prepare myself for, like, a five-month engagement just to even get to the point of closing the deal, if that makes sense? Yeah, that's actually a fantastic question. I think the relational piece does not get talked about or highlighted enough. There are times where I am approached in a way where it's either directly in a LinkedIn DM message. Hey, I work at this said organization. These are our needs. Would you consider funding us? Like a, a complete like blind reach out or sometimes the actual money nominal values there and that that at least in my opinion that's not the way you start a relationship to start up for success when I first met my husband I didn't ask him to marry me even though after a certain amount of months and days or, or no days weeks and months like I already knew that I wanted to get married but that's not where you start right away and funding is very similar like you need to have a relational runway that shows that you're a trusted partner, that you show up, that you're reliable, that you know how to articulate your value at, and that you are going to deliver on said agreed key performance indicators or outcomes so that the funding has a measurable impact. No, I, I like that because I don't think people always understand, especially like being on a small business, like, I just had a meeting with this person and like it went well. They're like, all right, when you get a check. And I'm like, that is not how that works. Like sometimes I've had relationships with people, people for three years and you don't even know why you met this person or anything, but y'all just for some reason stay connected. And then out of nowhere, they may need you or you need them. It doesn't even have to be, even begin of why I even met in the first place. But now all of a sudden you're paying them or they're paying you. And like, oh, three years later, but it's because you guys kept in touch. And that's one thing um, I try to tell people is that you want to build relationships, but you're not just building them just to your money at the end of the day is to actually have those relationships so when something is actually needed like something in the community needs to be done you could be like hey I, we had this conversation before can you help me with this and it's not even necessarily always funding um so within your role um how much of your culture or your community um goes into what you take into your everyday role what you do at work or does it at oh, all oh my so my culture, my community, like me being Latina, like yeah. a woman of color, being Puerto yeah. Rican. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it, first of all, my name is Saini, so it comes from the jump. Like, cannot <laughs> get away from it, even if I try. And that's okay. Like, that usually starts off that, well, where did that name come from? Or what does it mean? That That's like half of the day in terms of meetings. Like, people ask me that question early on. 
And I'll say I'm Puerto Rican, I'm a Chicago native. So that comes up quite a bit. And it's, it really allows me to just be me in ways that I would say in other points of my life where the whole, I'm mispronouncing your name or can I call you something else? It depended on where I was at from a mindset perspective. Like if I wanted to say, no, 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 you're not going to call me anything else because this is my name, right? Like I'm so far past that. Like this is my name. There's no other option. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm I'm not going to be Puerto Rican today and tomorrow I'm not. <laughs> No, that's real. No, that's real though, because Nasaini, Naisha, like they're they're completely different, but people still mess it up. Like it's Naisha, Naisha. And sometimes back in the past, you would be like, whatever, I'll just let them say it however. But then you get to a point where like, no, they say all these other names, so why can't they say mine correctly? And even when people do mess up, I've learned on the other hand, it's okay to teach people. Like, cause sometimes they really don't know how to say it. And sometimes it may be really weird to them. And so like learning on my end to like teach, but then on the other end, it's like, no, you gotta be willing to learn too as well. And know that it's okay that to not say it the first time, but you gonna learn it and you gonna say it. And I want, and I want to hear you say it too <laughs> as well. Um, but going back a little bit to teach for America and then your, your other roles, um, why take why take those roles on? Like I said, a lot of your roles um, have to do with community. Um, why is that a big part of what, like what you want to do with your careers? Yeah, I it's a big part of just my lived experience. You know, like I came from three generations of no post secondary attainment. My older sister was the first one to exemplify or model going to college, let alone getting an advanced degree. Like she really motivated and inspired me to see a world beyond what I could see, being a a product of government housing, you know, just very much restricted to just a, a few blocks, if you will, and living in a major city like Chicago, had it not been for my elementary school, which was almost seven miles away, everything I would have done would have been within like that five block radius. And when you just think about how small that is, it really came down to people that invested in me along the way. I've had a mentor for 11 years. He's followed me through my whole career. He was somebody I consulted with when I wanted to do Teach for America and whether or not it would be damaging to my career. I was getting ready to do human capital consulting So this was like a total change or or a pivot, if you will. And just getting his coaching on that, when it came down to the work that I was doing at IC Stars, like he was my coach. Like when I started at Microsoft, he was my coach. So that back to the community around you and how people invest in me to be successful, I want my life's work to be the same for others. Um, have you already or do you plan on being a mentor? And for you, what type of mentor do you want to be? Definitely currently a mentor. Mentorship is a big value of mine. It has really impacted my professional and personal trajectories. I would say the kind of mentee that I am and was is about reciprocating making sure that my mentors know, hey, I know you're giving up your time to me, but how could I help advance your efforts? Is there anything I can thought partner with you on? Or when I was younger in my career, I mean, any of these coaches could have been coaches on retainer and they never, ever once said that they wanted to charge me. I've since asked my coach, Caesar, do you ever want to put me on retainer? Because now I'm like fully employed, you know, and have an incredible... Like, I'm at an incredible point in my life now where if you wanted to charge me, I could pay you. And it's like, no, niece, like, the reason why I keep working with you is because not only are you reciprocal, but, like, you're malleable and you're coaching. So that's the kind of mentor that I want to be is someone that sharpens the people that I'm mentoring but also that the mentee would reciprocate, right? That they would want that, that they would want to do better, want to evolve, want to receive coaching. Mentoring is what you make of it. It's not something 
unless your employer forces it on you, it's voluntary. No, that's true. Um, I talk about the youth a lot. Um, with you being a mentor or being men being mentored before, what do our current day youth uh, need or how can we better be mentors to them now? Yeah, I would say for a younger audience, which I think the youngest person that I'm currently mentoring right now is 19 or 20. And first of all, you have to have people that have demonstrated like that they're down for you, that they want to see you succeed. I would say if we're talking about like a black and brown youth, being able to see somebody that looks like you, being able to see someone that understands like the plight of either growing up first gen, growing up low income, those are just different types of barriers that unless you've experienced it, it's it's hard to empathize. No, I that's why it's very important, like you said, for like you to exist or for us to have like representation because people could just come into our communities and teach us anything or say anything. But if you're never every day in the community seeing what's actually going on, it really has no impact to the people that you're that you're around. Um with your current career at Microsoft, uh, I know it wasn't all, all the way totally planned, um, but what growth or where do you want to see yourself, whether it's at Microsoft or with it, whether it's within your future career? Oh, yeah. I mean, definitely want to grow within my current role at my current company. I absolutely love what I'm doing. I honestly feel, you know, I'm a person of faith. I feel that the Lord really placed me here to have an opportunity to pour into others in a very impactful way beyond myself because this funding that has the opportunity and these partnerships and access to even things beyond funding right like access to different apprenticeships or different program experiences over the summer or young people or just people in general getting upskilled in very in demand skill sets that could change your whole life even. and that ripple effect is so much more than i just have a job i don't feel like i just have a job i feel like this is my calling this is my conviction and i really give it everything i have it's just a part of my personality i love that it's a part of your personality um i never say that but i feel like journalism and just like telling positive stories is definitely a part of who i am i never I never even really thought about it um, in that way. Uh, with you being from Chicago and you still working um, in Chicago, where do you want to see your city go? Um, whether it's with the youth, whether it's uh, real estate development, or where would you like to see the city go? Yeah, in Chicago, there's a lot of opportunity here. And it's also very clear, like very much different zip codes here have different opportunities. and it's really tough, not only as a former educator, but as a former student and young person of one of those zip codes, it can really sort of shape like your perspective of what you think is true about yourself. And I would like to see a place where the delineation of zip codes here are not dependent on affluence or inherited wealth. Right, but that there would be a pathway earlier on of discovery for inquiry that then translates into that generational access to wealth to not just be isolated to certain zip codes, but that from a community like where I grew up in Humble Park to just the south and west sides of Chicago, that those zip codes would start to look more like the zip codes that people come here from other cities to visit. I feel that because when people come to Milwaukee, they usually only go downtown and to the lakefront and they don't come to the 53218 or, you know, the 53216 or 06, whatever. And so I totally understand that, like, we need to start investing in those communities and not just the ones that look nice, but let's build up everything. So everything look nice. So everybody wants to visit everywhere um, in the city. Um, so with you having your family and you also, you know, working for Microsoft and, you know, you're building your career, how do you balance time? <laughs> I was just talking to my husband about this over the weekend, like just figuring out 
I'm the kind of person where I'm like, well, on Saturday, I could do a little bit of this. And on Sunday, after we go to church or in the evening, like I could do a little, like I just try to fit it in because in my mind, that's like more lives, more impact, more youth that could get served. And it's like, I constantly just want to come up with, well, if I build this program, how many spots, how many kids can get served? Or if I move this faster, then the funding can go faster. But there has to be, I mean, balance is like this very tricky word because I don't think it's a one size fits all. And the work life balance piece, it's like your work has to fit into your life. But what that looks like for each individual is going to be very different because it all comes down to what do you value? Yeah, and according to your bio, you like cooking with your husband and like trying new recipes and stuff. Um, so what are what are some new things you've tried recently, and what is it about cooking you like so much? Because I love cooking; it's so fun to me. I love like just being able to create something out of nothing. Like it just brings me a lot of joy. I do like to cook. What I like about it, first of all, is like we're hanging out. I feel like I'm spending time with my best friend. He'll, you know, chop up the vegetables. I'll season whatever meat we're going to have. Or if it's something like if we were making chili, he'll open up all the cans for me. Like that little stuff, it's just a little fun bonding activity. But the benefits of cooking at home is, number one, you know what you're cooking. And from a health perspective, right, depending on what you're making, so much better for you in terms of wellness. And then from a cost perspective, not that I'm not a fan of eating out. I definitely am. But that balance of how much you eat out versus cooking a meal is something that I care about. Um, what type of meals have you been cooking lately? We have made like almost like the equivalent of like a Chipotle like burrito bowl, but just minus the rice, just trying to limit the amount of like how many carbs we eat in a given meal so it'll be like sliced chicken avocado black beans sauteed peppers and onions is one thing or making you know like really hearty salads or like steak and veggies no, I, I love cooking. I can talk about cooking all day. One day, I want to eventually, like, either have a cooking show or a cooking book. But that's, like, way, like, way in the future. Like, I want to be, like, a, a like older, like, in, like, my 50s or, like, 60s. And, like, I used to cook this when I was, when I first started teaching myself. Um, <laughs> that's what, like, makes me really happy. Um, just a few more questions for you. Um, one being, so, Microsoft, working for Teach, Teach, Teach for America, is there anything of outside of like educating, outside of cooking that you feel like you haven't been able to tap into yet? Like, is there like something like in your next life or something that you, you haven't, uh, that you've always wanted to do that you haven't yet? Well, my dream job would have been to be a sportscaster, a sports commentator. I love sports. Hmm. So what's up with that? Do you, do you ever see yourself doing that? All right, what? Those are that's a really hard industry to get into. It's not one of those where you're like, oh, today I'm just gonna go work for ESPN or I mean there's different ways now where if you want to start a YouTube channel and just give your thoughts, right? But you don't work for a network. So I think in that regard it's changed. But to say that you're just gonna go work for NBC or ABC and not have any of the social capital nor professional lived experience to sort of back that up it's not an industry that's very transient you can't just walk in and out of like broadcasting i would say though that you can do it because for one we need more women to just talk about sports because there are a lot of podcasts where men all around this nation have just picked up a microphone and just started talking about just anything so i definitely think there's a there's a gap there there's a few to be you know there's something there to be filled um if you were to do something in that capacity would it if you could do anything would it be a podcast would it be a tv show um you like what what, what would you see yourself doing what do you want to do with that in that lane would it be a tv show hmm i don't know like you know sometimes people think they want to be on tv my sister's a great example she worked for cnn 
She said she wanted to be an anchor from when she was very, very young. She ended up interning for NBC here in Chicago and then got hired by CNN in Atlanta. And she had the opportunity to be in the chair. And then when she was on camera, she didn't like it. So she became a producer. And so I don't know, like, I'd like to think that I would like to be on camera, but I'm not sure. I'm all for whatever you want to do, because I love actually hearing your voice. So whether you want to do radio or on TV, whatever, I'm all for it. But I definitely, I really want to, I'm not that into sports, but I really do know that it's too many men out here talking about just like sports. And I really just really, 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 really want more women. So whatever you need, if I know anybody, I will reach out to them. Um, our time is running short, you know, uh, I don't pay for it. For my listeners, if you ever wonder why our podcast episodes are like 30 to 40 minutes, it's because I do not pay. I use Zoom and I do not pay for uh, the upgraded version because you know what? I liked it for one. One reason is because if you pay for it, people are going to talk forever. So it gives people a time limit because sometimes, you know, podcasts will go like an hour and 30 minutes, hour and 20 minutes. And then uh, uh, two, I'm cheap. And so I like to think, keep things, <laughs> I like to keep things on a budget, even if we're making like a million dollars within the next few months. I still want to keep things on budget. Uh, just, just a little side note to our listeners, you know, get us a, a little off guard. Um, but one of my last questions I have for you is um, when people listen to, to this interview, to this podcast, what do you want them to get from me? That you have an opportunity to, you know, make an impact everywhere you go. It's it's really a state of mind. If if you want to serve serve others beyond yourself, and in order to do so, it's constantly thinking about like what's the legacy that you want to leave behind, right? How do you want to be remembered? And something that I say all the time, like I try to say it once a day, is that your brand is in the room even when you're not. And that includes virtual and real life rooms. No, that that's 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 solid advice. That is so true. Cause if you if you always represent yourself well and don't even if sometimes when you mess up, as long as you can like stay and like go to the person that you messed up on and just keep your your name good. Even like you said, when you're not in the room, people are going to talk about you and they're in a good way and they're gonna come to you. They're like, oh, that person does this, so maybe I can hire them for this, or maybe I can bring them on my podcast to talk about this. So I really did enjoy having you on, and I really do appreciate you. Um, thank you for making time, and like I said, I know you're busy, so thank you so much for just just making time. And to the people listening, this is the Carbon on podcast we do cover positive news through articles video interviews we have a radio segment in milwaukee um um and then we also provide marketing so if you ever need branding consulting event activations hire us and then lastly whether you support carbon stone or just journalism period just make sure to support uh local and small journalism um with us being journalists and covering news we don't always get paid for it so please make sure just to go out and support your local journalists it does not have to be carbon stone but just if you turn on the tv and you watch your news every day you should be donating your money somewhere to some journalists um and make sure to visit us every tuesday so you can hear our positive news come to life and remember in the end everything will be carved in stone